Hello and welcome back to Custody Central. We're doing part three of our tier list and list construction guide. Um, so let's carry on. So let's have a quick recap of the summary of um, kind of part one and part two. So what, from my perspective, what does a skeleton of like a balanced, stable Custodes list looks like, right? And to me, it's going to have at least one beat, uh, one play champion. This is to, to, to help you get consistency in tagging a primary turn one. You want to have at least one shield captain for the free stratagem value. Um, you know, these units play for the primary. You probably want Trajan is going to play for primary. You want at least 10 guardians, not necessarily in one big squad. You can have um, a big squad, you can have two small squads, and you probably want more than 10 guardians, or maybe you want exactly 10. It's up to you. It depends on, uh, from my perspective, you know, if you're going Alaris or not Alaris, and how many Alaris you're kind of going. I think the value of bigger squads of guardians went up because of the nerf to desolators, uh, because obviously this was a really big target that made you very vulnerable against Oath. I think having less desolators hurt the Space Marine army a lot. They, they basically got nothing for it. <clears throat> and their other indirect also got a bit nerfed from memory. Um, so, you know, this depressed the strength of Space Marines, and I think it's probably reduced the number of Space Marine armies that are around, um, which means you are less likely to get punished running uh, a big squad of Guardians. And obviously, and also a big squad of Guardians allows you to deal with things that uh, a squad of five or even two squads of five might not be able to. Um, prime offenders on this list being something like uh, huge units of uh, Necron Warriors or the Necron Lich Guard Brick. So if you just have 10, you can just go like, say hello, and you're fine. If you're not running 10-man squad, 9-man squads, 10-man squads, you just leave them alone. You just let them have whatever they want, and you just don't get involved in that mess, because what will happen is you'll get in there and they'll just grind you down. You'll be stuck, you won't control the objective, it'll be just like a waste of your unit. You know, they'll have a unit there, you have a unit there, but they're scoring the primary and they're grinding you down. Um, probably you want a squad of Wardens. Um, you want to make sure you have a squad planned for Rapid Ingress. Um, I don't really mind what you have here, you know, this could be like... For, for me, this is going to be like a Blade Champion and Five Guardians. You want to have at least one Assassin. This is to help you tag the, the primary turn one. What I would say here, um, and we'll cover this at the end when we kind of look at list analysis, um, when we like poke holes and what is this list good at, what is it bad at, etc. Is that if your one Assassin is a Kalidus, there are many situations where you cannot risk losing that Kalidus turn one before they get off their Reign of Confusion. So as a result, if your only Assassin is exactly a Kalidus, this doesn't actually count to help you tag primary turn one because you can do it sometimes versus some lists because they just can't threaten you turn one. They don't have scout, they don't have infiltrate, they don't have fast units, they don't have advance and charge or something like that. You're just out of their threat range. But against a lot of our other lists, um, your Kalidus actually just isn't safe starting on the midboard. And then we have um, our two exaction squads uh, or prosecutor squads, depending on which one you're doing. These are just your, your action monkeys that are super cheap. I think, you know, 70 points, 80 points, really, really cheap. They're not a significant part of your list. They massively help you score secondaries um, as and when they come up. Uh, one of the really fun things I noted is that, um, you know, uh, I think like a day or two ago, Death and Glory have a YouTube channel. Uh, Brad Chester's on it. He's pretty good at the game. Um, he mentioned something, so I think we'll just do a cutaway clip on him agreeing with uh, with my takes on kind of taking action squads and at least an assassin to help you tag a primary, um, which obviously feels really good to have um, you know other people that are really good at the game validate your kind of opinions. That every for me, man, we, we've talked about this. If when you're bringing custodes, I just think the exaction squads and some assassin. I don't even care which one just goes in there. I like the Avasar because I'm cheap and he's got Scout. Uh, but you just, you can't put up goose eggs on first turn for your second, for your uh, secondaries, you know what I mean? It's just, yeah. it, you get behind, you can control the board, but you just can't get behind in points because you really want to just go absolutely nowhere. So, that was a fun little cutaway. Um, so what else do we spend the rest of our points on? <clears throat> and so here, assuming we left this blank for points, right? You're looking at the region of around 700-ish points uh, for the rest of your army. So here we have to decide, are we going to have guns or not? And this is this is a discussion where I've actually changed my mind a little bit. Before, I was very, very pro-gun. We'll go into that uh, in more detail in future slides. Now, I'm not so sure what the best answer is. Um, I think partially that's to do with I've kind of changed the terrain that I play my games on because it's more enjoyable to play on games with more terrain and more line of sight blocking because probably a bit biased because I'm in a melee army. Um, but also there are other factors that I hadn't considered in that much depth before, right? 
Second point we want to consider is how do we want to adjust our army construction for the flexible 700 points to match up for specific opponents, right? Or for the specific specific meta that you're playing in, right? Who's your player pool, right? This is kind of tailoring, but it's tailoring towards your meta. So I think it's still within the realm of um, acceptable behavior. <clears throat> um, and probably, you know, you should also be tailoring your list on guns, no guns to be amount of terrain that you play at your tables. If you're playing with lots of terrains, give no guns a try. If you haven't done, it's, it's really quite possible. Um, if you're playing on very sparse terrain, take take guns. Uh, if you don't have guns and you have plans whilst you're just going to have a bad time. Um, and you're going to be like, why is everyone saying custodies are broken? Um, another point, do you want any flavor units? These are units that I would consider slightly suboptimal, but maybe they make the game more fun for you and it's not going to be backbreaking to fit them into your list. Do you want any specific tech pieces? So here, you know, we're going to be talking about stuff like Drax, stuff like um, the Inquisitor Retinue Mystic, that um, that Hank Adams brought to the forelight. This is something that I looked at previously, and I was like, "This seems cool because this is something that we cannot get anywhere else in our in our list." All right, this is giving you the twelve inch deep struck bubble from the model, but I looked at it and I thought this this seems really expensive, and it seems only situationally useful versus very limited matchups. <clears throat> so we'll go we'll cover all this kind of stuff in in another video, but I think. I think this is this is an interesting thing that you want to consider. And at the end, after you've constructed your list, you want to look at how many points do you have left? How many points do you want to commit to your secondaries, right? And this is going to be a function of, you know, do you have a Calidus or do you have another assassin for you, for you to tag objectives uh, turn one? And how many Alaris squads do you have that are like small units, right? Or you could take, you might decide to take two executive squads and a prosecutor squad. You might even decide to take two executive squads and two prosecutor squads. I think there, it's probably too many points. You're better off just taking, um, you know, a Calidus Assassin at that stage. You do all the secondaries because you can just repeatedly deep strike and you get the Vex value. Um, but this is definitely something you can consider at the end of the points. So guns versus no guns revisited, right? So yes, in a previous video, I was very, very, very pro-gun. And I think a lot of that had to do with the map packs that I was playing on TTS. Not to say that those map packs were bad per se, but when I um, when somebody introduced me to GW style terrain with WTC style ruin walls, this gives you a lot more hard line of sight blocking. And this is stuff where you can't just touch the terrain and suddenly they can see they can see you, right? If there's a hard wall there, you know, they, they, they just can't see you. And this helps you a lot hide your army versus shooting. So the reason now the arguments for why you still want some shooting in your list. They still exist. It's just about which one which one is is better, right? From a from a strategy perspective, right? So the reason why you want some guns, or an argument for why you want guns in your list, is even though you're not a shooting army, even though the shooting that we have is not the most competitive within the game, it's competitive enough to threaten enemy units. So as a result, they still have to deploy safely, and that means they have to go, you know, behind some wall, some behind some cover which pushes back, which depresses their deployment. If you have no guns, they don't care about you shooting. Like, yeah, spears can chip some wounds off, but they'd, they'd probably rather be, you know, parked on the line um, and in a position to, to be able to shoot you, like, turn one, or getting really good angles um, to shoot you off objectives turn one, that kind of a thing. So having some guns in your list forces them to deploy in a way, like, so they can't get shot if you happen to go first. And this is, this is like a real tangible benefit, which is hard to measure, but just trust me, you, you will see the difference when you don't have guns, how, how shooty armies deploy versus you, versus when you have like even, even one or two Galadius in the list. So yeah, so you're not going to win the shooting war, but this isn't why you take the guns. And it's, as I said, it's just to provide a th credible threat to them, so they have to deploy a bit more defensively. And it's to give you an, a chance to take out a unit from their army that's very, very, very efficient. At, um, at killing your units. So if you remember back to my previous video, I said you're allowed to trade down as long as you are killing something from their list that is hyper efficient into your list, even if on a points level, it's disadvantageous. Obviously this isn't this isn't ideal. You'd, you'd prefer to take, you know, super point efficient units, but the Caladius is something that will, that can, you know, kill stuff like an extra cream. It can kill stuff like a forge fiend, right? And you'll notice here that these are all things that are doing three damage, the high AP and they have a lot of shots. So the reason is if you don't have any shooting, right, and they get some good firing lines, 
onto an objective that you might want to hold or need to hold, whatever. Let's say they have multiple of these shooting units, right? They're just overlooking these points. The way that this frame is set up, you can't hide behind, you just have to sit there and take these shots. If they shoot you for five turns and they screen out, which they will, because if they're a good player, they'll, they'll just screen those shooting elements out. You can't take four or five turns of this. You will be, you will, your army will just evaporate. So having these guns, even if it means you trade down, means you take out these threats and you, you'd be pointing, you'd be fighting the rest of the game at a point disadvantage, but they won't have these hyper efficient units that are just deleting 400 points of your army every single turn or something. So yeah, this is me kind of changing my mind on whether I need guns or not, or, or no guns, um, depending on the strength I'm playing on. Now also, shout out to Crumpkin Wargaming. This is uh, Johnny Sands, um, or the Ken Hammond Discord. He put out a video a while ago, which which raised my attention, right? Because he was like, I don't like Caladius. I was like, what? <laughs> um, he did some math on it. His math is correct. Um, but I don't necessarily agree with the reasons why you might not like a Caladius, just, just based on the math, because you know, he's saying, you know, you don't, you don't kill an armager, uh, with a Caladius, which on math, like I haven't, I haven't checked his math, but I assume it's correct. Um, because you don't quite get all the wounds off. And from my perspective, that's absolutely fine. If we take off 10.9 wounds off an armager, because we can, we can chip that off with spear shooting, right? That's actually not a bad result for us. Um, but also, you know, his channel is really, really good, by the way. Um, and I like the content that he does. He covers a few other armies other than custodies, but, um, I agree with like probably 99% of, of, of his takes on custodies. Also, he's a really good player, by the way, he's uh, WTC Norway. Um, and he's been having really good success with taking no guns. So then I really had to think like, okay, this is definitely like a new data point that I have to consider. Maybe this is the better opinion, right? So then I started doing some testing. Now also, Jack Harper from Art of War, also a pretty good player. He got asked on a super chat when he was doing like a, a list kind of a list video for, for not a custodian, zone, but, but he got a super chat about custodians and he got asked whether he, he prefers guns or no guns. And he actually says, even though he, he rated, I think, Caladius S tier in his tier list video, he actually thinks custodians are also better with no guns. So we've got these two points here, two really good players that are saying, don't take guns and custodians. It's actually stronger. And I was like, holy crap. So anyway, we'll do a cutaway clip to uh, to a video of Jack and hopefully I don't get DCA made for this because they're cool guys. Do you prefer all infantry custodians? I do, actually. I think the Caladius tanks took a big mobility hit because they fly doesn't work very well at all. And uh, it just no, and they move 10 instead of 14. They are more durable, but they also are kind of swingy depending on how many hits they get and how many invulns your opponent passes. The re-rolling to wound is awesome, for sure. But they are expensive, and two of them can just be another brick, and another brick probably gives you a little bit more. So, from my perspective, what is actually the real argument for no guns, right? And it is because, right, we have to accept from this outset, the Caladius is not the most, most efficient shooting platform in the game. Right? There, are, there are much better shooting platforms that are more points efficient, they do more damage, etc. I'm, I'm not arguing that. It, it is a good tank, but it's not that good, right? So some people come, still come from the perspective that custodies should still have guns. And that's because most, I think every other me pure melee army that can't really take guns, uh, I mean, I suppose they could soup in some stuff, but most melee armies are fast. We have some options to be fast, you know, with blade champions, but if we ran all blade champions, I think we'd be a bit too fragile. We wouldn't have the, um, the CP to, to pop the minus one damage when we need to. So it, it's kind of, it's, it's kind of weird. So some people will say you still need guns in a custodians list and they, they still might be right. You know, that I, I was definitely one of them, um, earlier on before I changed my kind of terrain pack. Um, and if you do that, if you think that, then it kind of doesn't matter that the Calidus is not the most point efficient shooting platform in the game at 215 points. It's still going to be S tier because you need this function in your list in the same way that I think, you know, you should have two exaction squads or, you know, two prosecutor squads in your list. You need this in your list. It's at a reasonable price point. It's automatically S tier, right? Now, what's the counter argument to having no guns, right? And that is, having played a lot of games, the profile is really good. It's supposed to be really consistent. In practice, it's not. And the reason for that is it's only got four shots. 
So even though these are really high quality shots, you're hitting on twos, you're getting lethal hits versus monster vehicle, you're twin linked, right? It's AP3, damage, D6 plus two, this is, this is all fantastic, right? The problem is when you're only firing four shots, and often your opponent is saving on four plus, not an invul, just a four plus, because they've got a two plus save in cover. Sometimes they've even got a two plus save in cover and they've got armor of contempt that they're saving on three plus, right? Your damage doesn't consistently go through because all they have to do, let's say, is they, they just roll two four ups and you've done no damage with your Caladius for 215 points. That thing's done nothing, right? So as a result, your variance is going to be quite large. And even if you take two, you know, I've had many turns where I've shot two Caladius and did like, either no damage or like three damage it's not supposed to happen that often i don't think but it seems to happen actually quite a lot on, on really key turns so my point is the variance is going to be large and my point is on the variance when you overkill or high roll it has significantly less upside compared to the punishment for when you low roll right and we'll go into this example a bit later but the punishment for you low rolling is way higher than you high rolling because typically you have a turn where they need to kill something or they need to finish something off on a point or they have to kill off this threat that will otherwise like you will take casualties next turn if this thing does not die and you will have turns like this where they need to do this because you invested these points into Caladius to shoot this thing and it doesn't do the thing and you can't control it because they only have four shots they only have to make a few saves, right? They just slightly high roll and they, they took no damage or they, they might even see people roll for this, right? On the other side, if you spend the points on infantry, infantry have five attacks. You know, your characters have got more than this. When you're rolling 30, 40 dice, your variance smooths out a lot, right? Basic, uh, like, how, uh, I don't know, I didn't really take a picture of this, right? But just follow my mouse, right? Caladius with four shots, the distribution is going to be much more flat. It is still going to be curved towards the middle, but it's going to be much more flat, right? When you're rolling 30, 40 dice, the normal distribution is going to look more like this, right? And as a result, you're going to be within one standard deviation of the average, or better, 84% of the time. And within that standard deviation, you're going to be very, you're going to know reliably what that number is. And that number is probably going to be enough to get the thing done that you need to do, which is probably going to have to kill whatever unit you're on, or kill enough models to to flip the objective or kill enough things so that's you know there's not enough stuff to slap you back um, in combat that kind of a thing this is like a significantly higher level of reliability so what is on you know i'm doing all this flip-flopping um so am, am i personally taking guns in my list or not and basically <laughs> it's a really annoying answer it depends i'm still on the fence um, I still need more test data for my personal games. So I've tried uh, about eight to 10 games with either no guns or a single Caladius. Um, single is, it's possible that a single Caladius is worse than two Caladius or no Caladius because you're just like in this no man's land of like, you know, you don't have the consistency of the two Caladius, uh, but you've got one, uh, I don't know. Um, what I would say from testing is that it feels a lot better than I thought it would not having guns in my list or only running one list, um, one in my list. And that's because I started playing on the um, on the WTC style ruins that have lots of hard line of sight weapon walls. Um, and on those ones on TTS, you know, you count the windows as closed. So that's really good. But I found that I was still sometimes losing versus lists that I just would not have lost if I had two Caladius, right? And in those examples, I just got shot off the board. They just set up some really efficient shooting units. They overlooked some objectives. I couldn't, like, I had to be on some objective to score the primary, right? And I just got shot off the board, basically, because I couldn't engage with them. I got screwed up. So from my perspective, this isn't, my personal experience is that it hasn't always been better to run no guns, right? Also, alternatively, I've ran into some lists where I really valued not having any guns, right? I valued having the guys more, right? Or I just I just win with the, with the no gun list, right? Um, it didn't really matter. Um, there's also just like a bunch of matchups where I think, you know, whether you have the guns or you don't have the guns, you were just always going to win anyway. Um, but then again, you also have these other games where you have the Caladius and they don't really do that much damage in the game because they just fluff their shooting repeatedly or they don't have very good targets to shoot at. And you still win, which means you've, you've won, you know, without really using 215 points or 430 points. That can happen too, right? In which case, actually, you could make an argument that the matchup was so favoured that the fact that you went no gun was kind of win more. So 
I'm I'm still in the middle. So I I actually think it, it might it might be a bit of a style adjustment that I'm going through, going into like one Caladius or no Caladius, and I'll probably need like twenty more games or so to to like actually get good. Like not a meme, right? I think it's very very likely that I just need to to practice more games with one or no Caladius and get better at piloting that list um, to actually to actually realize that actually this is this is just a superior way of playing the army. So that's very possible. Now the thing that we always have to remember is you remember when we looked at the uh, the charges and the uh, rapid ingress threat ranges, the goal that we should always be striving for is to minimize luck from the game. And obviously like it's a bit of a a lot of people play 40k for the luck factor for the um, you know when you get the lucky rolls it makes the game like really awesome and epic right but from a competitive standpoint when you're just trying to win the most that you can possibly win because you're like the sweatiest player in the world i'm not the best player in the world but i try real hard right <laughs> you're trying to minimize luck from the game as much as possible and you're trying to push it all towards player skill player agency right and so as a result if having no guns achieves that and your win rate goes up that to me means that this is the better way to play the army. So let's have a look at Caladius, right? So at the moment, I think it's up in the air whether no guns or guns is better. I, I'm just gonna have to wait for the test data to come in. People that are better at me at the game are telling me like, you're an idiot, just, just practice no guns more. Well, they're not saying I'm an idiot, but they're saying, you know, this is the better style of playing. I'm just gonna need more games to, to do that. So until then, where I'm still a bit agnostic, where sometimes I think guns actually would have been really helpful here, I think Caladius is an A-tier unit. If actually, as a matter of fact, it's just objectively better not to have guns, this just means that the Caladius is a D-tier unit. It's a D-tier unit not because it's bad, because you, when you're rating tier lists like this, you can't look at the unit by itself. You always have to look at what else could I be spending the points on that would make it more efficient? And in this case, if the Caladius is just objectively worse than taking more infantry and characters, it be, it, it's just data. You shouldn't take it, right? So, yeah. So I've, I've said before, you know, Caladius is winning because they've only got four shots. But why is the upside limited versus the downside, right? And the reason is you're typically you're typically not shooting at things you don't expect to kill, if that makes sense, right? If you are in a knight's matchup and you fight, you shoot one Caladius at one of their big knights, I mean, typically you shouldn't be doing that. You should be really trying to like kill something off the board um, to return volume of fire uh, on their turn back to you, right? So you're not typically shooting one Caladius at a big knight. But an example of a high roll that matters is if you shoot a big knight, you just get 20 damage through. That's a massive high roll. That actually helps you win that matchup, right? High rolling there. But typically what happens is you, you're trying to shoot something that you can kill. And when you high roll, you overkill it. You don't get that much additional damage out of it. If you happen to be shooting into like um, a bunch of units that have four wounds each, right? And you high roll, yes, you will get the, the benefit of the high roll. But often that's not the case. Often you're just trying to just kill that one, one model or something and you overkill it with like by 20 wounds or something. So here is an example of where you high roll, but you don't get the benefit. You overkill the, the model and these extra wounds, basically, they, they just go to dust. They're completely wasted, right? The punishment, for example, though, is let's say you shoot a big knight. It's got four wounds left. Obviously, it's, it's taken some penalties to, to hit because it's on this last bracket, whatever. But you, on average, you're supposed to do at least four wounds to a knight. But they just pass their saves and now you've done no damage right if you'd gone into that night with 215 points worth of melee it's very unlikely that they don't take those four wounds it's just the way that the variance works on the, on, the, on the dice so this is why i say you can get punished way more by high variance with caladius um than versus the high roll so let's have a look at land raider land raider is okay so i think you should not really be taking a land raider for the shooting if you want the shooting, you just take a Caladius, right? And the reason is it's significantly worse in shooting than the Caladius, even with the Hunter Killer. And that's because it's not twin linked. Twin linked is very, very big for consistency. The lethal is the lethal hits versus monster vehicle is nice, but frankly, when it's twin linked, it doesn't it doesn't matter that much, right? So why are the reasons you might want to take a, a land raider? And one of them is 
basically there's a lot of things in the game that shoot you and if you're infantry you get slowed some of them you know they slow your move they slow your your uh, your advance they slow your charge all that kind of stuff if you're on a land raid it doesn't really affect you the another reason you might do it is protection versus indirect or towering and those gun profiles might be less efficient shooting your land raider versus shooting your infantry models so it's, it's a way of basically protecting your models although it's a pretty expensive way of protecting models but you do still have those guns right so from my perspective if you're looking at a land raider you should be looking at it for the mobility first and the fire support second you shouldn't be going to a land raider because you want the guns it's at 260 it's very expensive as a gun platform so if you're doing this I think you probably should be doing this with Alaris with a shield captain. You're going to want a shield captain, right? We'll get into this later. But if your Alaris are in the land raider, they can't golden light if you're going second. Turn one, you go in second, they're in the land raider, they can't golden light. They can't golden light because they don't get abilities inside the um, inside the transport. That's in one of the, the rules commentaries or something, or it might even be in the court rules. If you have a blade champion, guardian squad inside, uh, the extra movement is good. Uh, obviously, we had the, the video on, you know, getting the additional three inches, threat ranges, um, your ability to get on objectives, etc. I think you can you can definitely do that, but I think they're probably fast enough. And what that leaves you with is you've paid 260 points for an inferior gun platform, right? You should have just taken a Kaleidus instead. The, these points are pretty significant, right? What was the difference? Like 45 points, something like that. That's, that's a whole squad of something, something small, but something or a model. So if you do take the land raider though, something that I do think is completely, completely mandatory is you take a leader, that leader takes inspiration exemplar. And that is because when your land raider explodes or dies, I mean, it doesn't have to explode for the deadly demise, but when, when it explodes and you guys have to get up, they're automatically battle shocked. If you're automatically battle shocked, you, you don't get access to strats. So you can't, you can't uh, do like the damage reduction or the fight first or whatever you want to do. Inspiration Exemplar fixes this because this is a way to, to cancel Battle Shock, not in your command phase. So if you do go land ready, you have to take this. So I think if you do want to take a land ready, it's, it's, it's beta, but you can, you can, you can take one. <coughs> let's, look at, let's look at the uh, the flyers now. Orion, I think it's just pure F tier. It's just way too expensive. The same kind of points for the Ares apply also to the Orion, <coughs> if you're a diehard fan, but it's, it's, it's way too expensive. It's like, it's not even talkable, right? So the Ares, you can start it in hover mode on turn one, but it's sad in hover mode because you're paying for the fact that it's an aircraft. You don't get the aircraft rules and often on a lot of kind of maps or, um, I don't know what you call it. Yeah. Maps or terrain because of the way fly works now on tent, you just get stuck. The model is so big. You couldn't really leave your deployment zone. You'd, you'd be stuck behind like a set of two ruins or something like that. You, you couldn't get up. That's bad. So having a unit stuck that costs like 570 is, is no bueno. Now you can reserve the aircraft. Um, even though it's more than 500 points in stroke force, that's allowed. The problem is for it to be deployed, it has its base has to fit within your deployment zone. No, within, yeah, is it? Within your deployment zone or your strategic reserve. Ah, has to fit within your strategic reserve uh, where it comes in. But the base is slightly bigger than six inches. If your base is off the six inch strategic reserve kind of allowable place that you're allowed to deploy, your unit can't move, it can't shoot, it basically can't do anything, which means you wait until turn three. But you can get around that by doing it in a corner. If you strategic reserve into a corner, um, you, you, your base actually fits. The fact that your model overhangs the board edges and all that, that, that's all fine. So an option is you can rapid ingress it, turn two, uh, then you can go anywhere, or you, strategic reserve, you uh, strategic reserve it into a corner of the map. Um, and then you can, you can actually shoot turn two. So that's the way you get around that. But the problem with that is if you've strategic reserve 570 ish points, you are actually not applying any shooting pressure turn one. So you lose all the benefit of having shooting in your list on deployment. They still don't, they, they don't deploy defensively, right? As a result, turn one. So you lose all that benefit. Also in turn two, when your unit drops in, and if you happen to whiff your shooting, 
because your blaze cannons aren't twin linked on the Ares, right, and they're only d6 plus 1 instead of d6 plus 2, you, if you're shooting, you've probably just lost the game. Sad, right? But this is, it's actually going to happen a fair amount, right? Because you've got the, uh, the magma and you've got the two blaze cannons, and you're either going to have to overkill something, probably, on average, or you're at a real risk of under-rolling um, on the damage, right? Or you spread your damage out too much and it doesn't kill all the things that you want to do. So I think this is an awkward unit, and as a result, I think it's D2. There will be some games where it comes in turn two as an aircraft, um, or it rapid ingresses, and you know, turn two or turn three, it goes to the back line, it picks up all the things that you weren't able to play with, it's going to win you the game, it's going to be awesome. But there's also going to be a bunch of games where it's not going to do that, and it's going to underperform in shooting, and as a result, you've played two turns of the game down like a quarter of your army, which is which is rough to come back from, versus an equally skilled opponent with an equally strong list. So let's have a quick look at Night Allies. I think the caster, I, I used to say the caster was good. After the points nerf, I don't think it's good. In addition, it's now over 500 points, so you can't even strategic reserve it. The reason you can strategic reserve the Ares is because it has special rules for aircraft rules saying you can always put it into reserves, even even though, uh, like, it goes into reserves, not strategic reserves, so the 500 point cap doesn't doesn't count. Castle doesn't have that, so it can't strategic reserve. If it can't strategic reserve, it's way too scary to take it, because a lot of things will just want on it. Um, and in addition, if you try and hide it, it eats up too much deployment space for the rest of your army. So it's, it's basically, it's, it's, it's unplayable, kind of. Porphyrian, similar reason, it's even bigger. Um, I think it might even be taller, so it's even harder to hide. And it has too many bad matchups, right? Because all of it's, you know, it's it's dedicated anti-tank, but it's like 700 something points of dedicated anti-tank now. So A, it's too expensive. B, it's bad into a lot of matchups. C, you can't strategically, it's like, this, this, this isn't a thing anymore. Right, <sighs> Warglaives. Warglaives are not a great shooting substitute, but they are a shooting substitute if you don't have Caladius, you don't have a land raider, right? So if you want to do that, they can do it. They're not good at it. They're not good at it. I have tried it. They're not good at it. But they do more than just shoot because uh, they move fast. So this will fix your problem of um, not being able to tag objectives turn one, assuming you have more than one, right? It has decent OC and it has credible melee potential. It does kind of a lot of things. And also it's what it's doing is giving you drops that are less than, because usually even your small bricks are like 300, 350-ish points um, or more, right? This is giving you a drop for about 140. Gives you a bit more play, lets you get into, you know, board, board quarters, get into objectives, like hide behind stuff, like because it moves 12, right? You can, you can do a lot of stuff with this. So the fact that it's shooting isn't that good, you shouldn't really view that as the only thing that it's doing, because it, it is providing a couple of other things for your list. And Helverins, I, again, I hate guns. Well, I hate platforms, but the primary thing that I pay for is an AP1 gun, right? So this goes back to why I hate the Palace. I hate the um, the Telemon with the Storm Cannons. Um, I hate Sag, right? If I'm mainly paying for an AP1 gun, I hate it. D2. Let's have a look at the other Knight Allies. And I think the three ones that I'd mainly look at if I were to run them is a Crusader with a lot of guns. Obviously, you take the double gun, you pick the ones that you want. You know, you could take the thermal cannon, but probably I'll take, like, the Avenger Gatlin cannon and the Rapid Fire Battle cannon. And the Rapid Fire Battle cannon has, you know, it is an AP-1 gun, but it is a lot of shots. It is a lot of shots. If you can get this onto a target that is saving on 3-up, if you get it on 4-up, you're in the money, right? But if you can say get it saving on 3-up, because they're not in cover for whatever reason, um, this isn't a bad profile, and to into a few things um, and there's usually there's usually a unit in an opponent list that you can land this on and it's not awful uh, but that still doesn't mean you should take Helverins because the reason is the Crusader gets towering um, so and, and it moves quite fast so you'll be able to get good angles with this but even so I don't think it's I don't think it's massively good right the other option is Canis Rex weapon skill 2 ballistic skill 2 really good it's got exploding fives really good but it's swinging on the number of shots with its gun. It is really good in melee though with Freedom's Hand. Um, so this one gives the Crusader, you're going to have to change change how the rest of your list looks. Like your list will have to build around these. 
if you take a Crusader, Canister Rex or a Castigator, right? But Crusader is all guns, right? Whereas uh, Canister Rex can operate in two phases of the game. Um, and this is this would be quite beastly about it. Castigator, basically a twin-linked 18 shot gun at strength 6 minus 2, dam two damage is, is just pretty good on its own. This isn't the kind of shooting that you really want in your list. You'd really prefer like a monster killing gun, a tank killing gun. But the fact that it's twin links kind of it's really good. It's really good. Crusader, I think, is getting a um, sustained one. This is really good. Um, this can also melee as well. Uh, not as good as Canis Rex, but you know, I think if you had to pick a big knight, like these are the, the three that I'd kind of pick. And I think they're all kind of C tier. Uh, I think the Castigator is slightly worse than the other two options. So I think knights as an ally, they're significantly less good after the points nerfs. Um, you know, I used to like Knight Allies when you know, they were T13 and 2 up save. Having to take one that's T12 3 up save feels bad, and you're not getting stratagems on them, so you're not getting rotate iron shields, which means you might be you you'll be saving on fives quite a lot actually, which dramatically impacts their survivability. You can't really compare them to knights and knights armies because you know they'll 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 rotate iron shields. Right? They'll get the four up. They'll get the female pains. You won't you won't get that, and you're not getting the bondsman abilities here either. So it feels kind of expensive and not that great. I think if you do want guns in a custodian's list, you just take the Caladius, right? And again, still has the same issue of you eat deployment space. Now I think especially if you take something like a Crusader, because this has a lot of guns and it is towering, um, you have to build your entire rest of your list around the centerpiece model. So you have to keep that in mind. So you may actually have to chuck out. Um, the normal skeleton of your list for this and this is to play like a tag and clean style list I'll do this in a future video but tag and clean is basically where you just put in you know a, a model or two onto an objective that's still controlled by your opponent at the end of your movement phase but then you just shoot everything off that was on the objective right this is what I call tag and clean usually we custodians are playing like a flipping style where we go in, we murder it in melee, and that's how we, we control the point. Um, but tag and clean is, you know, you just tow onto the objective and you shoot them off it. So what's my view on this? I think this probably skews your matchups a lot. So I think versus some lists, you just win really hard. And I think in others, you lose really hard. So this is, again, a reason I don't really like this as an option. But this can probably be a fun option to, to test in casual. What are the hidden costs of having guns? <clears throat> this are <coughs> some things. <coughs> excuse me. You might not think about when this constructing or, or playing your games necessarily, but you will give up, bring it down in tactical secondary sometimes. If you just don't have any of these tanks, you don't have any of these knights, you don't have any of these, you know, things. You just don't. It, this just becomes a dead secondary to them, so they can't score it. They'll they'll drop it for a CP whatever. The other thing that you might not think about is you actually provide an alternative profile for your opponent to shoot into as an efficient target. So remember, we're a skew army, we're all 2 plus, 4 plus, we've all got 3 or 4 wounds, and we like we don't care about our action monkeys, they can die, we don't care about them anyway, right? If that's all we're giving them, if they've got like strength infinite guns, and they're minus like 5 AP, and they're like 8 damage or something, 6 damage, it's kind of wasted on our dudes, right? Other than the wounds with the field no pain, right? It's just, it's overkilling them. But once we start adding tanks in, we now give these guns a really efficient profile for them to shoot into because this was their, their planned target. And you have to keep in mind, we're still in kind of a night heavy meta where a lot of lists are building to be able to try to take down a knight a turn, right? Obviously some armies, they still really struggle against this and they tend to be the bad armies anyway. Right, we like custodies. We, uh, you know, we would struggle to, to shoot a knight off um, a turn in shooting, but we get around that by basically just killing them in melee or just running around them and playing the playing the mission. So, yeah. So just keep in mind if you do decide to take some guns and some vehicles or something, we are giving them like a more efficient target profile for some of their guns that we would otherwise be forcing them to shoot into our, our infantry dudes. So let's have a look at the matchups with and without guns, whether it helps us or not. And into GSC, I think it is, it is better not to have big guns in your list, right? But we'll touch onto this when we look at the stat check uh, section at the end. Eldari, I think it's better with no guns because otherwise you will just lose 
the gunfight versus their fire prisms, which you'll probably never see anyway. Right? If you take if you take a Caladius, right, you'll you'll pop out, you'll shoot something, and you'll just get blasted with like I don't know what it's called. Um where they link the prisms and you just get blasted and they're re-rolling everything effectively, right? You're saving on a five up, you, you you're gonna die, right? You've traded really badly. So I think versus Aldera, you're probably better off not having Caladius. Or or knights, for example, right? Knights, do the guns help you or not? I think it depends on the terrain, but I think it's actually EV neutral, whether you have guns or no guns. I, I kind of disagree with Crumpkin here on it being bad to have Caladius into Knights. Um, on the Knight matchup, I think if you if you move your Caladius to shoot something, but you now get seen by like three or four Knights, you shouldn't do that. I think that's a bad way to play. Your Caladius need to be on the side. They expose themselves to only one thing, and that's the only thing that they're shooting. And basically, you, you're hoping to kill it, and it can't really shoot you back, right? Maybe one tank can pop out to see you and try and kill you, uh, and you probably live. But if you pop out in a way that they could all see you, yeah, you, you, you're going to trade really unfavorably, and you're going to die really quickly. So I think I actually think in the night matchup, it's even neutral to have guns. And I think, yeah, that's, that's about where it is. Versus Necrons, I think I'd prefer some shooting to take out, you know, the Destroyers, the Ghost Arcs, whatever buffing thing that you want to kill, or maybe just reach something far away. You know, maybe you want a cleaner screen even, right? I think it's useful. Thousand Suns, I think I want to have some guns, because they've got Forge Fiends and stuff. Um, maybe you don't want to deal with Magnus. Um, you know, obviously Magnus can blank some saves, it feels a bit sad against your Kaladies, but you're also forcing them to use kind of Ritual Points and CP for that. So, you know, and obviously, you know, if they've got Flamers, don't want to deal with that. It's not super efficient because I think a lot of them have invol saves. So, but even so, I think I prefer having some shooting versus thousand suns. CSM, I definitely want some guns, right? And again, it's a, it's just for the forge fiends, right? These exploding fives, lots of shots, damage three, AP two, AP three, something like that. Like I don't want to deal with it. I'd rather shoot. I'd rather kill those forge fiends and shooting, um, than take you know four or five turns of shooting from them. Chaos Demons, yeah, you don't want guns actually, because uh, bellacor has got this aura, uh, you can't really shoot the stuff with the aura outside of 18, it's going to feel bad if you have a lot of points tied up in that. Space Marines, I think I prefer some guns, personally, um, people can disagree, I think this might be one of these matchups where you can win without guns anyway, um, just from a comfort level I think I prefer to have some guns. Orcs, I think you can definitely win without guns, in the games that I've played, it just so happened they had a lot of transports, they had a lot of melee threat inside the transports, and I couldn't pop the transports in the shooting phase. As a result, I had to charge the transports, and, you know, they took some casualties because I wrapped it, and they had to emergency disembark and stuff, but they still got to get a lot of charges off, uh, because I've got so many units. Um, whereas, if I had Caladius, I could have popped the transports with the Caladius, I could have thinned out the orcs with the shooting, and then charged the contents that came out. Um, which would have been like a clean, clean way of removing that, that threat. It's Tau, I think it's very terrain dependent, but I think it's, I, I actually don't think it matters whether you have guns or not. Uh, like, it's a pretty soft matchup. Into Custodes, I, I think it's helpful to have more guns in your list versus them. Um, I know Steve Trimble, who, who won uh, Tacoma, he disagrees. He actually thinks the, um, the guns aren't helpful. And I think, it's going to be very swingy on on how your Caladius shoot into their custodies, right? If you can, if you can kind of high roll, it's massive, right? Because a lot of the times you're just going to be on the point. No one wants to charge until they've got like a significant kind of advantage. And I think shooting allows you to focus fire a lot of stuff. You know, even the the spear shooting into each other when you're very close on the objectives, and you you know if you happen to not be in cover, like these these can add up to quite a few wounds allows you to pressure some points and turn it into a point where you you feel comfortable charging into them even though they'll fight first. So I personally think it's it's probably better in the custodies matchup to have guns. Tyranids, I prefer guns, you know, I don't like the Exocrines, I don't like some of the big monsters. You also have to remember, even though we we are good in combat, versus armies that have like good melee units, they can interrupt you. So this is this is like another you know reason why I think you know having some guns is nice. You shoot some of the things, you don't have to charge so many things that you, you risk getting interrupted because sometimes getting interrupted is really bad. Grey Knights, having guns is really good because 
you know they'll just they'll just run away from you and score all the secondaries right but if you if you shoot them they you know they have the thing where i think if you shoot them a unit can can go back into reserve or whatever but it makes the matchup easier like it's a pretty easy matchup anyway um but guns help you here astro militarum i strongly want guns strongly want guns and the reason is i want to be able to take out their uh their artillery um if you're pure foot versus pure artillery it's a it's a rough time um depending on how they roll um against a good player you know they'll, they'll screen you out they'll have the rattlings up front to move block you they'll have the sentinels there to move block you um and they'll they'll just they'll be slowing you down with the basilisks and you'll just take lots of indirect fire it's going to be ugly if you what you have to do is you want to try and reduce their amount of indirects um and caladius are, are good for that if they shoot your caladius that's okay because that's a very it's not as efficient for them to try and kill that uh, because you're t11 world eaters again strongly want guns for the same kind of reason as tyranids um obviously we are better in melee than world eaters because we have fight first but the interrupts can be brutal whereas if you can shoot some threats and you can kill them off and then you don't have to charge so many things that you risk an interrupt um and then now i think we're going to go to a um go to the stat check website to look at some stuff but thanks for making it to the end of the video almost uh don't forget to like comment and subscribe and we'll see you after the cutaway okay so here we're looking at a stat check for some statistics for um how the various armies are kind of doing relative to each other and the meta and i think this is filtered only by kind of gts that have something like 32 players plus something like that so this is excluding your casual data this is excluding your rtts so we can see here um you can see this right yeah so we just see win rate here and we're looking at all the players um uh, that exist so you know we can see as we kind of know you know eldari are doing pretty strong they're winning gts gene Steelers is doing pretty strong they're winning gts and then under that you know there's like the next kind of tier right imperial knights obviously they've been um you know they've had the points nerf uh that's kind of changed them i think people it's just my feeling but i think people are kind of changing the terrain that the games are kind of played on which is impacting knight's ability to basically shoot off everything that's really threatening to them turn one and then just you know walk up and clean clean up the rest of the, the turns obviously custodies thousand suns um and even chaos demons are doing pretty strong and then down here we've got like the healthy segment of the game you know like uh necrons chaos space marines death watch orcs tyranids that kind of level and then below that we've got all the other performers and obviously at the very low end you have factions where only kind of the diehards are really playing so you know this is all well and known but i think what is more useful than looking at all of the data is um i mean in my mind it's only really useful to look at data for lists and factions and proportion of factions that are going like undefeated or only lo losing one game to see what are the really strong armies because from my perspective when i look at balance i don't really care you know how casuals are doing against other casuals i only really care about what is the most broken list that somebody can bring piloted really well and how does that do versus another army's most broken list piloted as well as possible right so we don't really have a way to do that here but what we can do is we can kind of exclude all the newcomers um, from the data and when we do that you suddenly find gene stealer cults which i've been you know if you're in the can hammer discord you've heard me ranting about gene stealer cults for weeks um probably to the point that you're sick of it but gene stealer cults i think are probably a bigger problem than Eldari um but I think people don't realize it because they're not as prevalent in the player meta you, you just don't come across as many genes to the cult players as you do Eldari and a lot of the genes to the cult players are not very good it's not to bash on genes to the cult players generally but there is a vast gulf of difference between a casual genes to the cult player and a genes to the cult player who like this is the army that they play they play this in and out they know the the army inside and out and when you play them you'll be like oh we are not playing the same game they're, they're, they're almost untouchable uh, versus a lot of lists and i think from my perspective as a custodius player if you go second against a really good gsc player and they're running a good list you almost have no chance if you go first i think you have limited chances it's not zero but it, it, it's I, I doubt it's even 25 percent if you go first and so i've spoken to a few GSC players who are really, really good at the game. One uh, plays for their country's WTC team. Uh, the other guy probably also plays for a WTC team, but I'm not uh, I'm not 100% sure on that. 
And basically the way they both described it to me is, you know, against GSC, you basically want to go first, you want to flood the board and you want to push them back towards their deployment zone as far as possible and just kind of depress them on primary. Your army is going to be dead or near dead by the end of the game, um, but you're just trying to push them back into their deployment zone as far as possible. If they go first, you, you'll, you'll, you just have basically no chance. So let's have a look. So I've been going on and on about this. So GC of the Colts, there's 72% once we, um, once we exclude the kind of the newbie players, I guess. These are the players that haven't gone to GTs before. Or this is their first GT, right? So this is the same as Elder, but why is this a problem, right? Because, let's have a look, see, where's their represented? Right, their player count is 21, if we just go by the experienced players, but they've won four events. Eldari player count was 50, but they've won, they've won three events. So can you imagine how many Gene Steeler Cult would be winning the events if they had, you know, 50 players? It would, it would look more skewed than it is, right? That's my point. Um, also, what have you got to look at? 43% of the experienced players that played Gene Steeler Cult went 4-0 at the start of an event. Let's just... 40% of them, more than 40% of them, what started the event 4-0. This is absurd. As it, so people should be looking at this at balance, but probably GW don't care about this so much because um, they're not super represented and so they don't show up in the stats so much. They're, they're able to kind of hide within the stats, you know, when you put in all the casual games where a lot of GSC players are losing. So they don't look like they have astronomically high win rates at the high skill end. They, they just do. So let's also have a look at the meta matchups, right? So what do we see here? We see Eldari at the top. Um, you know, we kind of knew that. We see Gene Stillers at the top. We also knew that. And we know that, you know, Gene Stiller cults aren't as popular as Eldari, right? This isn't, you know, massive news to anybody. Um, and we see Custodes. We've got, you know, we're bordering on the kind of broken because we're, we're above, you know, we're at 55%. This is kind of the maximum of where GW wants us to be. But obviously we're also a very popular faction with this win rate because in my opinion, you know, our army is really, really, really good at curb stomping less experienced players on the other side. Let's say it like that. So what happens if we filter this and we exclude the newcomers? What do you see? <laughs> yes, you see, Gene Stiller Cult are very, very good. They're 73%. Obviously, Eldari are going up a little bit because also Eldari in the same way. They have a lot of players that aren't really so good at piloting their army. It's a bit of a fragile army. It's a bit unforgiving. Um, so there is that now. Now let's see if we just put the veteran players. Do you see this? This is Gene Stiller Colts at 77% win rate in the hands of a good player. This is the problem. For, for, from a balance perspective, this is the this is the biggest problem. Um, now, from my perspective, Eldari, like I would wish that uh, you couldn't you couldn't proc dev wounds on a fake dice, but. I, I don't think that's going to change, right? But I think Eldari could still just be massaged um, with some point changes on some of their, they're still really, really good units. And I think they can be toned down towards like the 55% range, right? GSC, I, I don't really know how they're going to balance. Like from my perspective, I think they have to make their, you know, their blips. Everything has to come within six of the blip um, rather than just one model. And I think personally, they should just they should make it so that you can't combo demo charges with the three inch deep strike. I think, I think if you fix those two things, they come down a lot. Um, now it doesn't sound like that many things, but that, that really is a lot of things because those two demo charges like will destroy, you know, a third of your army. Uh, and there's usually not that much you can do about it. I mean, depending on which army that you play. Um, there are some tech things that we'll go into in, in future videos, but GSC are like a real, real problem. So let's look into peer v peer matchups. Uh, no, not this one. Faction win rate trends. So let's filter for everything after the balance updates. And what do we see? We see Gene Stiller Colts. I mean, they're still in the top with um, with Eldari. But again, let's take out the newcomers. They're now at the top. I think. How do I zoom this out? It's hard to see, but Gene Steeler Colts are just slightly above Eldari here. And if we take, if we go just to veteran, although this is going to be like even less kind of games, can you see this win rate? 94%. Games play is only 18. Do you see a problem here? 
it's going down a bit because I think here, you know, they're down to 83% now, but I think this is in large part due to, um, like, you get better against playing GSC after you've seen the horribleness that they can do to you the first time around. You get a little bit better, but it doesn't really make the matchup palatable for an army like Custodes. So let's have a look at the matchup matrix. This is pretty interesting. So let's have a look at the things I really want to care about are probably Eldari, Gene Stiller Cult, and obviously our army, Custodes. Okay. So Custodes, you can see, uh, is this looking big enough? Uh, let's see if I can make this a bit bigger. No, not really. I have to keep it like this. So Custodes, you can see, you know, we've got a bunch of favorable matchups. We're not, we're not really favored into Eldari. Um, we're not really favored into demons and we're not favored into gene silver cults, right? And imperial knights, but everything else looks pretty, pretty healthy, right? For us, gene silver cults randomly. Oh, they just lost one game to, to blood angels. Death God, they seem to struggle against for reasons. That I'm not actually sure why. Um, I couldn't tell you that, right? So let's have a look at what happens when we exclude the newcomers from the game. We're still struggling a bit into Eldari uh, as Custodes. We're struggling a tiny bit into Chaos Base Queens. I think this is just because the Forge Fiends have like a really, um, like just a really good profile into us. And if they make them, you know, shoot with exploding fives, bad things can happen. And you can see here, we've got a 24 win rate, 24% win rate, right? When we are, no, yeah, when we are experienced, right? If we exclude newcomers from the opponents, we get a 9% win rate versus Gene Silicon. I mean, obviously this is only 11 games, right? My point is, at the high end, when you play a good Gene Stealer cult list, you are screwed. <laughs> and I think particularly for, uh, for Custodes, I think it's just a very, 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 very uphill matchup. So as a result, even though taking tanks against Gene Stealer Cult makes the matchup even worse, I kind of think it do almost doesn't really matter because whether you had tanks or not, I don't think it's going to change the win rate that much versus a good player. Like for, like if they're intermediate or whatever, like maybe you know it it makes more of a more of a difference, right? So from my point, I'm not really advocating tanks or no tanks. I'm kind of still agnostic here on this, and I'm still trying to make up my mind. But my point is the fact that taking tanks or taking guns into the GSE matchup makes that matchup worse shouldn't really matter, in my opinion. Um, hopefully they will kind of errata it. Uh, I mean, they said they won't do balance changes um, at the end of the month in the FAQ and that would just stick to FAQ instead of balance. But I really hope they kind of touch GSE a little bit. So let's have a look, see if we, uh, not this one, if we just do veterans, we'll get even less data, but you can see how bad it is. We don't win. Well, I mean, this is only two games, but you, you basically don't win versus GSC, right? Like it's a, it's 11% here. Like if we do it like this. So anyway, and you can see, uh, let's see, let's get rid of the newcomers. Let's keep the experience in to make it kind of a bit balanced. You can see GSC basically only have good matchups like this. I, I, I just assume is an anomaly, right? Eldari, I can only assume here there's some there's some Death Guard professional who just like crushed. Um, but you can see also Eldari, they're not doing good into Genes of the Cults either. So anyway, this is just me moaning about Genes of the Cults and them being broken for a bit. But it, it was mainly just to point out the fact that just because you take guns into GSE and it makes the matchup worse doesn't mean you shouldn't take guns to make that matchup better because you, I think you're pretty screwed in the matchup anyway. I'm not saying you don't have chances if you if you go a, if you are a diehard no gun list. Obviously, this is great for you because you're like, oh, this gives me better chances into GSE, which I agree it absolutely does. Um, but I don't think that should persuade you. So this is why I'm still kind of agnostic on the guns, no guns.